And we have the privilege of having Tim Moore come up and share with us from God's Word again. I had the privilege of getting to know Tim a number of years ago as I began in youth ministry. Tim is one of those individuals that comes along, youth pastors at all stages in their career, and encourages them, challenges them. And I had the blessing to be able to be encouraged and challenged by Tim. And I figured the best way for you to kind of get into his mindset, and that's the mindset of Tim Moore, is for me to read his last week of Facebook updates. Oh. He has some great Facebook updates, and this will help us understand Tim in, I think, a different way. So today, he does one each and every day. Today's was, and these are great questions, things to ponder. If one synchronized swimmer drowns, do the rest have to drown too? (laughs) On yesterday, he said, do Siamese twins pay for one ticket or two tickets when they go to the movies or concerts? On Thursday, snakes don't drink coffee because it makes them viper active. I'd tell you a chemistry joke, but I know I wouldn't get a reaction. What do we have on Tuesday? People who take a lot of selfies are just trying to save face. Monday, why is it that when we skate on thin ice, we get into hot water? And lastly, his Sunday one, I really like this one, was, is a pessimist blood type B negative? So, just great questions to ponder, and if you need that, find him on Facebook, and he'll give you a new question each and every day. So thank you, Tim, for coming and sharing from God's Word. I've always appreciated you and your heart for the church and the heart that you have for God's people, so thank you. Thanks a lot. You know, I, I never really want to see the people's faces when I write those stupid things <laughs> or, or when I really find those stupid things, really, because I'm not that brilliant. They just make me laugh. So I thought maybe somebody could use a little chuckle or whatever, you know what I mean? But you're, yeah, you do get an insight to what I might be like a little bit. And last night was one of those nights where you get to see what I'm like a little bit. And I think in pictures, okay? So tonight we're going to paint pictures again. I don't do PowerPoint and all that because I don't know how. And I refuse to know how because I'm that old and I can be like that if I want to be. All right, so na na ni boo boo. Yes, imaginations. Do you ever have, an, like you have imaginations, right? It's been a long time, I think, since we've had to use our honking imaginations. I really do. Uh, like when I was younger, we used to put a cardboard box over the stick shift on our Mustang, high-rise Mustang, right? And that was the gas tank. And we used to put Montreal Canadian hockey cards in the spokes because nobody liked Montreal. Uh, and that sounded like the engine, right? That was cool. Imagination. I was a wild hog before wild hogs were cool. And imagination, right? Do you, do you have an imagination? Like, did any of you play, like, combat or 12 o'clock high or man from uncle or gun smoke or riflemen? None of you did, did you? Okay. Well, then I'll talk to us tonight because we're cool and you guys aren't because we had imaginations. We just had the best imaginations ever. So keep that in the back of your mind because we're going to paint a picture of what it's like to move ahead in our spiritual maturity. And you need a bit of imagination It's not evil, so don't worry, all right? But keep that imagination thing in mind for a minute, and I do that to try to get you to go back to being like uh, a kid. Not just a kid like a teenager or a tweenager, I mean like a child, like just a child. Have you ever seen them dance? Oh, it's so fun. I wish when I went to weddings, And I got the opportunity to dance because heaven forbid I dance anywhere else but at a wedding because it's legit there because you're having a celebration of somebody's coming together, right? But they dance. They waddle around. I love the YouTube clips. Yes, I know YouTube. I can't do PowerPoint, but I know YouTube. And the kids, they stand in front of the TV. One of my favorites is a friend of mine's kid stands in front of the TV and he dances to uh, Dynamite, the guy Dynamite. Because it's uh, the red hair, Dynamite. Never mind, I can't think of the name. What's the name of the movie? 
Napoleon Dynamite. Yes, because he has a goofy dance. And I have a friend of mine, his kid stands in front of the TV and does that dance. It's so, you've danced. You have danced. It's usually in the bathroom in front of the mirror with the brush. <laughs> yeah, you get it. I saw you smile. You dance. We all kind of just kind of in the bathroom, you know, we just kind of, I don't know, we dance like the white men Canadian shuffle, you know, it's more like, it's a little bit more like this. But when we really know nobody's looking, right, there's always place for an air guitar. Yeah, yeah we've done, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's not bad, is it? It's not horrible to have that kind of an imagination and dance. Have we ever danced to Amazing Grace? Nah, no. No, not really. Have we ever danced to the old rugged cross? No, but we get pretty moody. We get a little teary when that takes place sometimes. But children, oh, when Fred Penner, oh, I just dated myself, so we can't use Fred (laughs) Penner. Uh, Wiggles guys, there's probably somebody newer than the Wiggles. They, they, They dance. They love to dance to those things. Cheerleaders dance. Well, you know, then they do their, when they do their, they, they dance, and it seems to be okay for them because they're celebrating guys jumping 10 feet in the air and just throwing a ball really hard through a little hole. They, they cheer. They dance. Fans dance. Fans dance. Not a fan dance, but fans dance. I, I happened to be, I had, I had the opportunity to be at the World Series in 1993. When Joe Carter hit the ball right past my nose and right into the left field. I watched it go right at head lower. And the people in that place went honking ballistic. 55,000 plus. We were all dancing. I didn't care what anybody said. And I thought the cement was going to crumble. We were dancing so hard and jumping up and down and screaming and cheering and just, Wah, ha, ha. Oh. Dancing. I found cool little places in Scripture. Remember I told you last night? There's neat little places in Scripture. Yeah, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4. Even God says there's a time to dance. Oh yeah. So don't feel guilty when you're dancing in the in the when Shaggy comes on or when when whoever comes on. It's okay. You can dance a little bit. David danced. I have proof. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 6. When he won the battle, he danced. And the people danced around him. In chapter 21, verse 11, after the Goliath thing, they danced again. And by the way, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 14, we all remember that dance. Oh, yes. And we don't dance that way. Because the whole place would shake and fall down if we did that dance. And we would be arrested probably. Because it's not cool to dance that way today. Is this little talk that we're having right now, is it devoted to um, getting followers of Jesus to dance? Well, no, but yeah, a little bit. But dance, uh, but the dance that we did as children, that was awesome when they got that gift, that, that gift. I can remember my son, Matt. He, we didn't give the kids anything but like an empty box or something with a little note in it. No, snorkels and flippers. We gave each kid snorkels and flippers with a little thing in it. And they, they, like my middle guy, he's not the brightest, but, <laughs> but he looked at the note and he just went, what? Well, why flippers and math? You're going to the Bahamas for two weeks. And he just, he just stood there. What's the Bahamas? <laughs> uh, and then it dawned on him what it was, and he, didn't he, Nan? He ran up and down our living room, into the dining room, up the stairs, all like dancing the whole time. But the dance that we did when she waved to us for the very first time. Oh, 
that's that kind of dance, right? That's the dance where you don't want anybody to see it, but you have that excitement. You just, <clears throat> okay? Uh, but there's the dance that we do when it's the first snowfall. <sighs> that, you know, there's a little bit of that dance. Unless you're a, a boarder or a rider, and it's kind of like, oh, 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 there's that kind of dance. But what I'm getting at is the childlike excitement, the joy that makes you so pleased to dance. Pleased to dance. The, 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 the one we do when somebody does something wonderfully cool for us, like a home run or a winning goal or the best gift or the amazing grace, that's the kind of dance that I'm talking about that we should do. Where did that dance go? What, what, what happened to it? The dance of amazement, the dance of, of, of wonder, they're absent. Those dances are gone, it seems. Again, do we dance to amazing grace? Oh, what happened? Here's what happened. Our spiritual life got messy. Our spiritual life got messy. And messiness, that's the workshop of maturing spiritually. If life didn't get messy, I don't know that we would actually mature spiritually or move into the, what we call the deeper life. We wouldn't do that more than likely. Look, this message, um, let's look at it this way. It might be considered the handwriting. Look it. It's the handwriting. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to type either. Um, this is the handwriting of some kind of wide-eyed observer who can barely keep up with what's happening with God and his love for imperfect people. This won't be some kind of grand, magnificent uh, message. In fact, for those of you that know me, this will be uh, irritably messy. It'll be lopsided. It'll be interrupted with rabbit trails and annoying things, perhaps. Just like that very first dance that somebody has. You know, is it bad to ask if you've ever been to a dance in junior high? I guess that would be bad because some of us may be not allowed to, you went to a dance? Oh, you're going to burn in eternal perdition. <laughs> you, both of you. Yes, sinners. Um, you know, I, I was allowed to go to one dance in um, uh, elementary school, and it was because I had a broken ankle. And my, and my mom and dad knew that I wouldn't be allowed to dance. I had to stand there. And it was just as well because it's so awkward, right? The first dance. The first dance is one of the most awkward things that you can ever experience. Would you come here for a second? Oh it's just, it's awkward, isn't it? When that first dance, when you go and you take that position. Some of us know this position, right? This is kind of like the, the first position. Go ahead. Look at that. So just move your arm down. Oh, move your arm down to my elbow because that's the right position. Uh-oh. So then the next thing that we have to do, did I just do something bad? I did something evil. Does that look okay? Help. <laughs> Is that good? Does that work? Okay, we're back. So if I went like this, oh, you know, you got to step with this foot. If I step with this, man, is your hand ever sweaty? <laughs> this, are you embarrassed to be up here? This isn't awkward. So like we could go, to, so you got to go step, step. Okay, you ready? Step, step, quick, quick, step. And then I would step back and I might... I don't want to do something like that. Okay? It's awkward, isn't it? It's, that's awkward standing up with a fat guy that you don't know. Gray hair. You know, in the church. The, the doing a dance. It's just so weirded out, right? That's what it is like walking with Christ. It's awkward that way. Do you get the picture? It's just awkward to make that first move and, and make that, that, that first kind of dance. So listen. 
That's the imagery. That's the imagination that I want you to have tonight as we look at some of this perhaps formula to have a deep dance or just a dance with Christ, a dance with the Holy Spirit, or a dance with God. Now, don't think me sacrilegious because I want you to get intimate with God. So, the formula for the dance. We don't dance very often because it's, because it's, it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. It's sweaty. It, it, it's, uh, it's, I don't know the steps. We say all those kinds of things. But in this formula for the dance, the first thing I want you to know, if we get like a child, if we get like a child, we can dance. And you know, I didn't come up with that idea. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, unless we become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What do you have to do with little children? You have to feed them. You have to wash them. You have to dry them. You have to dress them. You have to model for them. You have to tell them. You have to show them. You have to do for them. You have to let them do it. Then you have to assess what they do. (sighs) That's the spiritual life. Do you get it? Not only do we just have to be like children before him, we have to let him parent us. Have you had a child that doesn't let you parent them? I had one. I had one. In fact, one of her most famous lines was, Katie, sit down in the back of the van. No. Sit down in the back of the van. No. Sit down or I'm going to pull over. You know this line. So I'm pulling over. No, I'm sitting down. I'm sitting down. But in my mind, Dad, I'm still standing up. (laughs) She's in university now. Soon to go on her internship. And God bless the church that gets her. But, but children dance, don't they? They, they, they dance. And, uh, children, I don't think this is a word, but they unpretend. Children unpretend. They usually refuse to pretend about anything. They don't, they don't lie, pretend to lie. They, they, don't, they don't pretend to tell the truth. They often tell the truth unless they're caught red-handed doing something. They, they, they refuse to la- allow others believe they are something other than what they're not. They'll ask their questions. Grandpa, Dad, if a cow laughs, does milk come out its nose? <laughs> and they think that's a perfectly natural question. Dad, How come when I block up the windows in my room and I stand at the light switch and I turn off the light and I run to my bed, how come I can't beat the light? Where does the light go, Dad, when I try to make it to the bed? That was a pretty good question when I heard that one. But kids will ask those kinds of things. Okay, so let's get to it for a second. Let's make some application of being like a kid. Do you ask those kinds of questions of God? Not like the synchronized swimmer thing and all those kinds of things. But do you ask those kinds of questions of God and then sit and just look at his face like you did your mom and dad when you asked those questions? Like, Because he's probably kind of sitting there going (laughs) and trying to figure out some cool way to answer you, to grow you so that you dance a little bit better with him. You can ask those kinds of questions of God. You see, adults pretend. That's why our spiritual lives or our deeper life or our spiritual maturity, uh, grow, our growth in holiness is messy. It's because we pretend. I don't want to know anybody to know that I, and you fill in the blank. We pretend we're not like that. Um, we've got to tell the truth to ourselves. We have to tell the truth to ourselves about sin. We have to tell the truth to ourselves about our feelings 
and about our joys, and on it goes. We have to tell the truth, just like a little kid. Unless you become like that little kid, you won't get into the heaven. Here's the second piece of that formula, if you need a formula. Understand like a child that you are going to grow up. You are going to grow up because you are unfinished. I don't even know if that's, well, I guess that's a word because there's stores that sell unfinished furniture, right? You're like unfinished furniture. You got, well, you do have stain on you, but you don't have the verithane on you yet. Or, the, or you haven't been sanded down enough yet, like that unfinished furniture. But you are still growing. I have biblical proof for that too. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. If I could remember it, I would say it off the top of my head. But believe this. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. You see, that was a teacher pedagogy thing to try to get the group involved, but only the preacher. <laughs> only the preacher wanted to join the thing. So I may as well wrap it up here and sing a worshipy kind of song and then go get some ice cream or supper or something. Okay, but you know that verse is in Scripture, chapter 1. You're not finished yet, and that's cool. That's cool that we're not finished. That means you can understand that you are imperfect, that you are in process, that you are under construction, and that you have yet to arrive. So why the rip do you act like you've arrived? Ooh. I can say that because I'll only see you one more time tomorrow. Do you want to go deeper in your spiritual life with Christ? Understand that you're unfinished. You don't have to be finished yet. And that's hard, isn't it? The third little idea, don't take this incorrectly, but you and me, we're incompetent, if you will, at this dance. We're incompetent at it. This holy living, no one does holy living perfectly. Only one person did it perfectly. Holy living is humiliating. We recognize that we don't pray well. We don't pray enough. We don't evangelize enough. We don't read enough. We don't kneel enough. We don't navigate through temptation well enough. We don't dance well by ourselves. Or maybe some of you think you do dance really well by yourself because that's why you don't dance in the bathroom or in the bedroom, so to speak. But without recognizing the Holy Spirit in our lives, having residence in our lives, goes with us everywhere present, with, he's within us, we don't even know how to dance without him there. And we can have him. We have him. He's the one that makes us new creations, new creatures, regenerates us to be new. So we have the Holy Spirit. So teach us to dance is what we can say. But the thing about Jesus is that he cares more about our desire than he does about our competency in the dance. He, he likes to know that you want to dance at least. He doesn't care if you dance as well as the guys on Dancing with the Stars. It doesn't matter. Don't dress like them at least, all right? <laughs> Here's the fourth piece of the formula if you need that formula. Begin to stop pretending uh, and recognize that you're unfinished and that you don't dance well alone. That's because you ought to be desperate, desperate uh, for that dance partner. Maybe I'm the only one in the room that would understand this, but in that dance that I went to in grade eight on the crutches, Oh, she was in the room, and I wanted so desperately to dance with her, not because I had the moves, but because I wanted to be by her side, and I wanted everybody to see her by my side, and I maybe, you know what it's like in a grade eight dance, we would, we would have a life together after that, <laughs> completely and totally, she was the one. 
Now that's maybe funny desperation, but have you ever seen anybody that's been desperate? Messy spirituality is a good term. It's a good place to be for desperation. That's where desperation meets Jesus is when it's messy. Think about it. When when you're catching hell, don't hold it. When you're going through hell, don't stop, right? You, you, You ever seen that bumper sticker? It's a, it's a great gospel song, but I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> but it's when we're going through that hell that we call out to God more, isn't it? That's when we're really messy because we're really dribbling here. We're dribbling here. Kleenex are gross. We're mad. We've punched. We've hurt our wrist because we've punched the mattress a number of times. But that's when we really cry out to God. Look at what happened in Scripture. David, when he was going through messy times, God! Uh, when Job stood out there on Pride Rock, like, where are you, you? And then, oh, the whirlwind starts, right? That's when God speaks. And it was messy. It was so messy. Hosea's life, when he was going through it with his wife, flaunting all over town, selling her body, that was messy. Have you ever seen a desperate person? We had the dance idea. But how about somebody that needs their fix on whatever it is that you're thinking of that they need their fix in? How about drugs? Or how about trying to get out of the drugs? Or how about somebody that's been drowning? Surely there's a lifeguard in here. This same girl that wouldn't sit down One time in a baptismal service, our senior pastor thought it would be good to go to a real pond to have a baptismal service, and I took my little daughter, I don't know, she could barely walk, out on this little deck thing or dock thing out into the water, and there was about this much space between the deck and the dirt, or the, you know what I mean? And wouldn't you know, my little daughter, she fell in that little gap. The water was only about this deep, but when you're only this thin, that may as well be this deep. She fell down in there, and it was all slow motion. No, 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 no. I looked down, and I saw her laying on the bottom of the dirt water pond thing, and her eyes are just huge, and there was this remote, you know, and I reached down with a friend and grabbed her and pulled her out. Like, that's desperation. I was desperate to save her because my wife would have killed me if I had <laughs> killed her. <laughs> Something like that, right? But that was desperation. About four years ago in my world, I have another son who was heavily involved in the drug world here in Calgary. Killed mom and dad. Should we leave ministry? Should we stop being a pastor? Should I stop teaching at Bible school, teaching people how to be, have a savior, a sanctifier, a healer, and a coming king? Should I stop doing that? Every night he would go out, we'd hold our breath until one night. I don't know why, but I'd always text him, do you need me to pick you up? He texted back, not yet. Two hours later, he texted me, now, pick me up now. Where are you? I don't know. You know, God did something that night. I didn't know where he was. I got in the car and I drove to where I thought he might be and he was sitting on the curb and I said, Matt, are you ready now? And he said, Dad, yes. He was desperate. Desperate to get out. Have you ever seen anybody desperate? That's how we need to get wild-eyed and become that desperate. They can become strange. They can become unbalanced. They can be uncooperative and they don't fit and they're, oh, they're demanding and they're frantic. Imagine that as a dance partner because that's how frantic and that's how desperate we have to get to want to spiritually mature or go deeper with Christ. We have to get desperate. Desperate people can't stay away from that which they crave. 
So what do you crave? We always do the deer thing, panting for water, right? The deer thing. But we shoot deer, so... (laughs) And then we eat them. So pant for the water all you like. What about you, right? What is it that you crave? We don't shoot you and eat you, so take the time to think about that. For what do you crave? Desperate's a strong word. And people who are desperate are often rude and fanatical and reckless and explosive and focused and uncompromising, and they really desire to get what they want. They will work hard to get what they want. What is it that you want? Do you want Christ? Do you want to mature spiritually? Or do you want people to see or think that you've matured spiritually? I have, I have a list of desperate people. I, I make lists. Anybody that's ever taken a class with me knows that I teach out of lists. Here's a list of Old Testament and New Testament people who were desperate. Noah, David, Abraham, Jacob, Lot, Solomon, Rahab, Sarah, Saul, Jonah, Hosea. They were, these people were God-loving, courageous, brilliant, fearless, loyal, passionate, committed, holy, faithful, strong-willed, gentle, and defenders of the faith. They were also murderers, adulterers, manic depressants, insecure, mentally unstable, unbelieving, shrewd, lying, uh, grudge-holding, I can't even read my writing, Uh, penniless riffraff, and prostitutes. That's the Old Testament. Oh, the New Testament is much better. We'll just focus on the 12 for a minute because actually Jesus said, hey, come and follow me. I'll give you your mission. I'll help you with knowledge. I'll, uh, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they got up and followed. They picked up their cross and followed him. But they were troubled with infighting. They jockeyed for position. They were suspicious, accusatory, impulsive, selfish, lazy, disloyal, and didn't understand. They were desperate people. And look at what they did. Look at what they did. I love it. Here's a fifth idea. We've got to remember that dancing with Jesus or going deeper in the Christian life is where the unqualified get qualified. All right? So if we were to go to the set of Dancing with the Stars, okay, you know the show, right? Some of you watch it, I can see. Some of us just wish we're in the arms of that significant other one. And anyway, but you don't get to go on that stage unless you're qualified. You know that, right? Well, maybe somebody in the room here could get up there. Don, I know Don could, because he's just got to, you know. But you don't get on the stage with Dancing the Stars without, without being qualified. What I'm suggesting is that we got to get qualified as well as sanctified, rectified, purified, and occupied, all right? We've, we've got to get to, to those places. The messy spiritual life is the Arthur Murray school of dance, so to speak. Uh, think for just a second. We look awkward in our dance, but God has provided the dance instructor, not just the instructions. Could you imagine if I told, well... You two are married, so that wouldn't work because you probably... uh, But if I told some couple just to get up and dance and I just stood here and shouted out instructions, that would be awkward. But if I was the instructor and came over and held your hand, moved your feet into positions, stopped the music, started the music, and helped you, showed you how to do it, wouldn't that be a little bit better? That's the kind of instructor that Jesus is. He doesn't just give you instructions, all right? doesn't do any better just to tell you to try harder, to read more, to watch more movies, or to to wear better clothing. No, we've got to get qualified. And it's only Jesus Christ's grace, God's grace, that makes us qualified to be in the messy place. That's why we sing Amazing Grace so many different kinds of ways. 
we think that we're good dancers. We think that we're good dancers, especially in the room, but have you ever had to try to maintain that little bit of cool step that you have that you flaunt in the bathroom or in the bedroom and you try to keep it going on for like three and a half minutes or two and a half minutes? It's awkward. It's awkward. And we could respond a couple different ways if we dance like that. We could go, oh, I stink and I quit. We talked about that last night. We could think... uh, untowardly and go, boy, I am really good. I'm a good dancer. And all the while, everybody else is going, aha. Um, or, you could, or you could stop pretending that you're a good dancer. You could try to understand that you're unfinished and that you're incompetent and that you're desperate and that you have to get qualified. Get rid of the myth about fixing yourself. Get rid of the myth about fixing yourself. We think we're so good When you decide, though, to become qualified, you may try to fix your dance steps. Let Jesus fix them. Let Christ fix them. Messy spirituality is when we need other people. The Holy Spirit and the body of believers, they become our instructors and they become our partners. You do, you do understand, don't you, that there's at least 44 one another's in Scripture, that we don't live this spiritual life by ourselves? You do accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but so do a whole bunch of other personal people accept him as their personal Savior. So you join a family You join a body. You might become the armpit or you might become a fingernail. You might become a toe. You might become an arm. But you join a family and the family and the body works together. So you never have to dance alone. Whoa. If I had known that when I was standing on the crutches that I didn't have to dance, that that didn't work. Let's try something. Let's try something. Let's try this. Everybody put up your right hand for a second. Okay? Let's do this. If you've never told an untruth in your life, you can take your hand down. Okay? If you have never kind of looked on somebody else's paper for an exam or kind of uh, fudged a little bit on a paper, you can take your hand down. If you've never taken anything that doesn't belong to you, you can take your hand down. You see, you've just started the first dance move. It's great to be here with all you other liars, cheaters, and thieves. Okay, that, that's a good step, and that's funny ha-ha step, but that's the first step that you need to take to go deeper in your spirituality. So you did this in a community. You just told everybody that you're a liar, cheater, and a thief. We all knew it, but we pretended we don't, we, we're not like that. We, nope, 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 no, I never, do. but you did it in front of everybody. It's easier to go dancing now because everybody else is in the same boat. Not that misery loves company, but Jesus does because he fixes that. He fixes it not you. His Holy Spirit fixes it, so to speak. Every, every illustration will probably f- fall apart in some sense, but here's the seventh and last idea that I'm going to give you tonight. We can all dance as the undanceable. Whether you are a good dancer or dancing with the stars or not, you can dance. We can pretend uh, to, 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 to not be finished. We can pretend to be unfinished, but you, we've got to become desperate, become qualified. We have to receive our instructions from the instructor from heaven. Do you want to dance? Do you want to dance? You've gotten the metaphor by now, right? I don't have to keep repeating this dance thing. I, I think you get it. Would you, would you please let other people dance around you and hold your Pharisaic snickers about their dance moves to yourself? 
we can joyfully celebrate because we want to escape the cold, sterile spirituality of religion where only the perfect and non-desirable get in. Amazing grace. I've mentioned a number of times that we should probably dance to amazing grace. So let's try to sing it for a second and see if we can dance to it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but step. <laughs> but we get the song, right? Maybe we have to do something a little bit different to make sure that we can dance to it. Hip to hop, to hip it, to hip it, it hip hip hop, you don't stop rocking to the band band boogies to jump up the boot. Rhythm of the boogie to beat. Well, what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. Me, the crew, and my friends, we're gonna try to move your feet. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less day to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The hip, the hop, the hit it, the hip, hip, hop, the hop. See, it can be done. It can be done. Now, if I can do that as awkwardly as a fat white guy, <laughs> it can be done. So this is what I'd like you to do. As much as my dance moves there were so cool, <laughs> I want you to challenge you, to ask you, to beg you to lurch. Because that's what my dance steps were, lurching. I want you to lurch forward to Jesus where the unwelcomed and the unqualified get qualified. I want you to hear Jesus tell you, you can dance. With every, when everyone else says, don't you dare dance. I want you to hear Jesus walk over and whisper in your ear, a handicapped Christian, do you want to dance? I want you to hear him say tonight and ask you to dance. There is unfettered joy in the dance with Jesus. So I think you can dance. If you don't agree, let us dance at least when we leave the room, the worship center tonight, and go home and go to bed. Because you're going to go home remembering that you're a new creation, a new creature. Prove that by dancing out of the room. Now, tomorrow morning, we're going to dive into Scripture just a little bit differently again and talk about the disciple shift that has to take place if we want to dance well with Christ. Okay? Heavenly Father, this imagery of David dancing and you saying that there's a time that we can dance Help us to get that picture. Some of us have may have been kicked in the behind a little bit tonight, understanding that we look down our noses at people that dance for you. Some of us are feeling guilty that we have been that awkward dancer and have given up going deeper with you, trying to grow maturely, 
to try to have our faith get more mature. We've just given up and said it's too hard. May the picture of the dance and the awkwardness that most of us often feel around a dance drive through to our core. Speak to us. Push us to change our attitude so that we can have a deeper life with you. That we're willing to have a deeper life with you. That we'll pursue having a deeper life with you. And may we never stop thinking of being with you when we're driving, when we're churching, when we're studying, when we're (laughs) working. Whatever we do, may we always perceive that we're with you. Amen.